have represented literature in those in those things and i now we look forward to hear from you lin i request you to present please thank you very much thank you yes <clears throat> and thank you thank you for sharing the slides as well um okay everyone so um the first thing to say is very many thanks to Professor Pradip and colleagues at the University of Oroland for inviting me to this fascinating uh, two-day webinar on death, mourning and disease in the 21st century. Um, obviously a topic which is very close to everybody's hearts at the present time. It's uh, a great honour to be here, especially since I too have warm memories of meeting Professor Pradip and colleagues when they attended the, uh, uh, the conference at Lancaster University in 2009 uh, called Glocal Imaginaries. Um, this conference was the culmination of a four year funded project on literature and migration in the city of Manchester. And it was wonderful to welcome delegates from all over the world. Um, I'm sure you can remember it was, it was a huge conference. We had about 300 participants. Um, people from every corner of the globe, but of course, including um, the team from uh, Borrowland. So thank you very much again for rem reminding us of, of that lovely occasion. Um, now, my memory is that the University of Borrowland had recently been founded at this time, and it's wonderful to see that it's now a fully functioning educational establishment, uh, providing high quality international education and research opportunities for the region. So, so it is great for me to see that in that 10 year period, um, you've achieved your mission and your, your, your wonderful new university is up and running. So that is excellent news. Um, given the focus of this uh, seminar on death and disease, um, I'd just, uh, like to take a moment also to offer my condolences to those of you who might have lost loved ones as a result of the pandemic. Um, as you may be aware, we've had a very high death rate in the UK also. And like many thousands of others, um, I too lost a close friend to this disease. So I think we're in a situation now where, um, you know, very few of us are not touched in some, some ways by these, you know, the, the, these in, in many ways, these very tragic times that we're living through. Um, therefore, while it's important to share innovative uh, new academic research on death, uh, ageing, mourning, all these themes, um, it's also important to recognise that this is a topic that is now deeply affecting for many of us in a way that it wasn't before. So I just wanted to say that just a, a few personal words before um, I actually go into, into my paper on this topic. So um, I'm, I'm, I'll begin with just uh, just a, 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 a general outline of how I'm going to use the time. So really, the paper is in two sections or the presentation is in two sections. In the first part of the presentation, I'm going to talk about the field of mobility studies, because I thought this was going to be new to, to some of you. And then um, the, the second part of the paper uh, draws upon my own research um, and I'm going to use the example of a reading of Thomas Hardy's novel, The Woodlanders, to demonstrate some of the ways in which I've used mobility's um, theories and approaches to um, analyse literature. So that's the, 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 the two parts of the paper. Um, so uh, could we have the, the second slide, please? <clears throat> That's great. Thank you very much. Thanks. Yeah, that's perfect. Thank you. Um, so in the, the, the short time available here today, I'm going to speak to your conference theme by drawing on my recent work on the mobilities of mourning. In particular, I'll be using Thomas Hardy's 19th century novel, The Woodlanders, to demonstrate how 21st century mobility scholars like myself have sought to better understand the significance of movement and repetition in the rituals associated with death and mourning. 
So those are t t two of the key concepts that I've worked with, movement and repetition. Therefore, although the literary text I'm going to talk about is an old one, um, the, pub the Woodlanders was published um, in 1887, many of the mobility practices that it describes are just as relevant today. And I'm confident that there will be many fascinating um, overlaps with the death and mourning rituals practiced in South Asian religions and cultures. And I think this is going to be one of the most interesting things for you over the, the next couple of days to compare and contrast, um, obviously, different, different practices, different traditions. But I'm hoping that through my paper, you will go on to think about the role of movement and mobility in particular in all those in all those rituals. Um, it occurred to me that uh, not all of you or maybe not many of you will know Thomas Hardy's novel. Um, so, so for those that, of you who don't, um, I'll just say a few words about the plot so that when I get on to talk about it, you, you can follow what's happening. Um, it's a very interesting novel. I must say it's one of my favourite uh, Hardy novels. And it revolves around uh, the love triangle that exists between uh, a young woman called Grace Melbury and her two suitors, uh, Giles Winterbourne and Edred Fitzpiers. Um, I'm sorry about the names. The names, the, the names are quite strange, even in English. But um, you'll see that when I go on to talk about the novel, I, I tend to use the first names of the characters because they're a bit easier. So we've got we've got Grace. Um, and then we've got Giles and Edred. Um, Giles loves Grace, but Grace's early affection for him wanes when she is courted by Edred Fitzpiers, a young doctor who comes to live in the village. And uh, they eventually marry. But a second uh, covert uh, romantic subplot revolves around another woman's love for Giles. And this is Marty South. Uh, a young woman who works in the forest alongside Giles. So she, she's part of the, the G Giles and Marty are part of the, the labouring classes that work in the forest doing all the, the forest industry and labour. One of the most distinctive features of the Woodlanders is the uh, uh, what's referred to as the Shakespearean unity of time and place in which the action takes place. Uh, the woodlands of Little Hintock um, are a unique environmental and cultural microcosm with ancient traditions uh, completely cut off from the rest of the world. The men and women who live there share ancient working practices that have been handed down for centuries and the industrialised Victorian world has yet to intrude. So it's, um, it's a fascinating novel in any number of ways, but... Uh, in particular, the way in which Hardy conjures up this this uh, you know, vivid picture of um, a community and culture which is 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 very much isolated from contemporary uh, Victorian life. So, um, going on to say a bit more about the context for this research, um, the specific context for these reflections on one of Hardy's most fascinating novels is my recent and ongoing research on the way in which the mobilities associated with love and courtship are a continuation of those associated with death. So I'm actually making a connection with the type of movement and mobilities that were engaged in during courtship practice and those which are involved in the rituals of death and mourning. Um, indeed, the central thesis of my recent book on this topic, Mobility, Memory and the Life Course, is that mobilities of different kinds are not only generative and defining of intimate relationships, but they often feature in the habits and routines we adopt to mourn the loss of a loved one. So I'm looking at some mirroring, really, between the early stages of a relationship and the end of a relationship. In other words, the tracks, both literal and symbolic, that we lay down at the start of a close personal relationship, be this a marriage or indeed a close friendship, uh, stay with us forever. In Hardy's novel, the tangled relationships of three characters, Grace Melbury, Giles Winterbourne and Marty South, 
are illustrative of just these sorts of recursive mobilities, whereby couples and families return to the same places throughout their lifetimes, and also demonstrates how many of the most personal mourning rituals may remain invisible to the rest of the world. And that's uh, really a, a, another theme of what I want to talk about today, the contrasting uh, visibility and invisibility of death and mourning practices. However, before I proceed with this exploration of death and mourning uh, in Hardy's novel, um, <clears throat> I'd like to begin today by introducing you, <clears throat> excuse me, to the field of mobilities research and the theoretical and methodological approaches that have informed my work for the past decade or so. This will include some discussion of how humanity scholars have begun to engage with the field over the past decade and why certain disciplines, most notably literary studies, have been slow to properly engage with debates originating in geography and sociology. Um, I'm aware that the audience I'm speaking to here today is a very interdisciplinary one. Um, Professor Pradip told me that there would be people participating from many, many different um, academic areas and, and disciplines. Um, but I know that it also includes colleagues such as Professor Pradip and his team specialising in English literature. So I trust this will be of particular interest and hopefully inspire some of you to get involved in mobilities research yourselves. Uh, so could I have the next slide, please? Okay, so slide three, if that's possible. Slide three, please, Rustam sir. Yes. Okay, lovely, thank you. Okay, so a, a very quick introduction to mobilities scholarship. And I should say, um, I'm happy to leave these slides with you and for you to, to circulate amongst the, um, the webinar, if that helps people. So it, it might be quite difficult to read everything or catch everything. So um, it's, it, it's fine to circulate these afterwards. Um, Yes, the first thing to say is that mobilities is now a vast scholarly field attracting scholars from many scores of disciplines, even though its roots in the UK uh, were very much in geography and sociology. The academics who named and defined the field in the early 2000s included my colleagues at the Centre for Mobility Studies, uh, sorry, the Centre for Mobilities Research at Lancaster. Um, these were the sociologist uh, John Uri and Mimi Scheller. Um, as well as the geographer, uh, Tim Creswell. Scheller and Uri devised uh, what, uh, is what, what they called the new mobilities paradigm, new mobilities paradigm, uh, sometimes uh, some, uh, shortened, contracted as NMP, new mobilities paradigm. Um, so they, they <coughs> excuse me, they devised this concept to help highlight way in which the contemporary world is characterized by human and non-human mobilities of different kinds um, and across different scales. While um, Tim Creswell's book uh, On the Move from 2006 famously defined mobility as movement with meaning. Okay, so movement with meaning. Um, and before I go on, I'm just going to say a little bit more about the new mobilities paradigm because uh, uh, some, maybe most of you won't have come across this before. So I've, I've just um, uh, uh, produced a very short definition of the concept, which might be helpful. So uh, the new mobilities paradigm is described by John Uri as an analytic tool um, which sheds new light on the workings of contemporary society. By focusing on the significance of movement in all aspects of human and non-human life, we gain valuable new perspectives on the systems and practices which facilitate some aspects of social life and frustrate others. So the mobilities paradigm is very much about mobility on the one hand and immobility on the other. So uh, which um, systems in the world facilitate mobility for some people which, which social, economic, political systems frustrate mobilities and 
uh, make movement difficult for other people, for example. So whenever you talk about mo mobilities, you're always also talking about immobilities. Um, compared to other theories and definitions of mobility, the new mobilities paradigm is disting distinguished by its insistence that human mobilities are entangled with non-human ones. The mobilities of ideas, goods, services and things are as important as those of people themselves when it comes to understanding the workings of contemporary society. <coughs> Excuse me. So, <coughs> sorry, in, 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 in a very short, uh, uh, short summary that, that hopefully gives you some idea of what the new mobilities paradigm is about. Um, next slide, please. Rustam sir, next slide, please. Thank you. Thanks. Rustam sir, next slide, please. Is thank this you. one? Yeah, that's 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 fine. Yes, that's fine. Thank you. Um, okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, since then, scholars from a, around the world. So when I say since then, I mean since the early two thousands. Since the early two thousands, scholars from around the world have helped develop the theories and fashion the debates inspired by this early scholarship. And anyone interested in finding out more has the benefit of several excellent handbooks on the subject as well as the back numbers of journals such as Mobilities, Applied Mobilities and Transferred. These are the, the journals listed on the slide, um, uh, all of which are easily accessible online. So I would recommend if anybody wants to get a snapshot of this field, um, probably one of the quickest ways to do so is to take a look at these journals and indeed the handbooks which were listed on the, the, the previous slide as well. Um, next slide, please. Rustam San, yes. Yes, thank you. Got that. So at Seymour, so this is the Centre for Mobilities Research um, at Lancaster, which I'm involved in and indeed which John Uri and Mimi Scheller founded in 2003. And Seymour, Seymour, we are also more than happy to add you to our online uh, mailing list, which now has uh, 1,500 members from around the globe. And if you'd like to join, please just contact our administrator, Harriet Phipps, via the address on the slide. Now, I, I, I see that the URL is, is, isn't easy to, to read because it's in dark blue, but again, hopefully if you can circulate the slides, um, just, just get in touch with this. Um, and you know, we, we always love to, to welcome new members um, and it would be wonderful to have some of you join, join the mailing list as well. Um, and then the next slide as well, please. Next slide, please. Rustam sir. Sir, the next slide. Uh, is it okay? Yeah, yeah, next slide. No, not this one. The next one. The next slide is okay. Next one, please. Yeah. Next one. Next yeah. one. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, is this the one? No, no, not yeah. this one. The next one. Ne next no, one. Not this one. Next, next, next. next. Yeah. Next, maybe. Uh, 
Yes. Ah, yes, sir. Said yes. No, no, no. Yeah. Is this the one, Professor Beers? That's that's great. Yes, it is. Thank okay. you very much. Okay. Thank you. Yes. So, um, uh, it's, okay, 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 okay. Uh, it's, okay. It's gone. It's gone. <laughs> it's gone. Gone. Before. Yeah. That's it. Yes, yes. No, ah, no, it's it's the what oh, that's yes, that's it's, it's already showed, yes. It's it's slide number that's the one, thank you. Yes, 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 this one. That's yes, brilliant. Thank you. This one. This one. Thank this you. one. Thank you. This one, this one, thank you. So it's, it's only uh, really in the past decade that mobilities inspired research has really taken off in humanities subjects. Um, so that's obviously crucial for all, all of those of you working in literary studies and humanities. Uh, bringing mobilities research to bear upon these subjects is really quite recent. Um, a departure that was heralded both by the launch of the journal Transfers in 2010, so Transfers reached out to more humanities-based research, and uh, also the colloquium called Mobility and the Humanities that Peter Merriman and I hosted at Lancaster University in 2014, which led to the publication of the special issue and book of the same name. So these were the two of the things which really marked the beginning of humanities subjects getting involved in mobilities research. Um, this subfield has developed very quickly since then, and there are now two international centres dedicated to research and teaching in mobility humanities, one at the University of Padua in Italy, and the other at the University of Konkuk in South Korea. Even so, literary scholars have been amongst the last to become interested in mobility theories and approaches, so I very much welcome opportunities like this one to spread the word and introduce mobility scholarship to new audiences. Um, indeed, one opportunity in particular I would like to draw your attention to is the book series Paul Grave Studies in Mobilities, Literature and Culture. Um, it's listed there at the bottom of the slide, uh, which I co-edit with Marion Aguiar and Charlotte Matteson. The series has already published 10 volumes from scholars all over the world, and we've, we would be very happy to consider proposals from India and the Asian subcontinent in the future. So by all means, if you've got your own publications coming out, do, do think about our series. And then uh, next slide, please. Okay, next slide. Thank you. Rustam, sir, next slide, please. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Ah, I think I think we might have jumped two ahead there. Yeah, we have skipped. Yeah, we, we got back one, if you can, please. Rustam, sir. Yeah, I think this is the one. Yes. No, no, no. Then the next one. Is uh, uh, no, we're going forward. <laughs> okay. I don't know how. I got to. This is not the one. No, no. Th 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 that's the one, this one here. Thank you very much. That's the one. Okay. Thank yes, you. yes. This. Okay. So just, just a few words specifically on mobilities and literary studies before I move on to the main part of my paper on Thomas Hardy's novel. So the first thing to say here is that there is something of a paradox at work. Um, literary scholars and text-based research most certainly informed the beginnings of mobilities research through classic mobility-focused publications such as uh, Karen 
oh, I think we've might have moved backwards again, but never mind. Karen Kaplan's Questions of Travel and Mary Louise Pratt's Imperial Eyes, Travel Writing and Transculturalism, as well as through the post-structuralist literary theory that was the prerequisite for thinking about subjectivity, space and place in new and interesting ways. Further, post-colonial studies played a crucial role in helping scholars better understand the way in which people, goods and politics circulate in the contemporary world, especially with respect to migration. So important to recognise here that um, a lot of literary and literary cultural studies really predated um, and, and informed the beginnings of mobilities research. Uh, yet it is, I think, partly because post-colonialism in particular has become such a huge and well-established field uh, <clears throat> within literary studies in its own right, that scholars working there haven't chosen to engage with mobilities research until recently. And I'm, I'm, I'm sure that this will apply to many of you, um, uh, both researchers and students, uh, you know, post-colonial post post-colonial studies has been huge for a long time and in some ways it's dominated literary research to such an extent that I think there really wasn't an appetite to engage with with yet another field uh, <clears throat> and I think for a long time there was a bit of a misconception that mobilities research was so social science focused that it wouldn't actually help very much with um, textual analysis. And yet there is arguably a great deal in mobility's approaches to post-colonial concerns that are novel and enlightening, such as the way in which the new mobilities paradigm moves across scales and continually seeks to link the way in which micro-mobilities impact upon macro-mobilities and vice versa. And you'll see when I get onto the part of the paper where I talk about Thomas Hardy's novel, there I'm very much looking at what we would think of as, as micro-mobilities. Um, this said, scholars like my colleague at the Paul Gray book series, Marian Aguiar, um, are nevertheless making some really exciting connections between post-colonial and mobilities research. And some of you might be interested to check out her two most recent books because of their focus on modernity and mobility in South Asia. Um, the first is a book called Tracking Modernity, India, Trains and the Culture of Mobility from 2011 and uh, the second a book called Arranging Marriage Conjugal Agency in the South Asian Diaspora from 2018. Um, so as a literary scholar Marion explores these themes through a, a rich variety of literary and cultural texts. So that's a good example of the way in which uh, post-colonial studies and mobility studies are beginning to talk to each other. But uh, another reason why literary um, scholars have been slow to engage with uh, mobilities research is undoubtedly the fact that in the UK especially, the field has been very influenced by the post-humanist turn in sociology and geography. Now, while there is, of course, a great deal of interest in post-humanism within literary studies itself, there remains, I think, a fundamental tension between research which is focused on the human subject, as most literary scholarship still is, I think we've probably all agreed on that, and that which seeks to actively decenter human experience in order to explore the world in a, la in a, a rather less um, uh, uh, androcentric way. The work of my mobilities colleagues at Lancaster has developed alongside the rise of um, an approach known as actor network theory. I'm not sure if people will have come across this. Actor network theory sometimes contracted as ANT, A-N-T. Um, uh, and a, a post-humanist approach established by John Law and Bruno Latour in the early 2000s. And the new mobilities paradigm, as conceptualized by Scheller and Uri in 2006, uh, uh, likewise makes clear that we should attend to the mobilities of goods, finance, commodities and data, as well as people. So this idea that we should take the human and the non-human together uh, owes a lot to these, these theories, or these post-humanist theories, and in particular, actor network theory. 
So these new approaches have led to some incredibly rich and powerful analysis of the way in which the human and the non-human world interact. But the approach also creates problems for those of us who retain a deep interest and fascination in human psychology, as many literary scholars do, um, including the workings of memory, uh, I guess the workings of memory and the imagination. Indeed, in my own work, I've had to struggle quite hard at times to make the two, the two approaches speak to one another. And uh, it's, it's therefore not, not perhaps surprising that none of the books that we've published uh, so far in the Mobilities Literature and Culture book series adopts a post-humanist approach. And the authors prefer to engage with the concept of mobilities conceptually and thematically rather than fi via the new mobilities paradigm. So just, just laying down here some of the, 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 the things, in a sense, which have prevented literary scholars perhaps engaging with mobi mobility scholarships more than they have so far. Um, in all the presentations I make on this subject, I nevertheless encourage scholars working in the humanities to try and make the connections between their research and that of the sociologists and geographers who, who have led the field in recent years, since it's through these encounters that we have the potential to bring something fresh and original to the analysis of movement and mobility of every kind. So I, I think the, the, the new breakthrough research will really depend precisely on bringing, uh, bringing these, these different um, approaches together. OK, then, so I, I now move on to the second part um, uh, of my paper, where I'll share with you an example of how exploring a literary text through a mobilities framework led to some interesting new insights for me uh, into the crucial role that movement plays in defining our relationships with others. So this is where I move on to talk about um, Hardy's novel. So uh, next slide, please. Rustam, sir, next slide, please. Yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, um, yes, the mobilities of mourning, thinking about this through Hardy's The Woodlanders. So I'm going to begin with um, a description of Thomas Hardy's funeral, um, which is taken from my viewing of a fairly extraordinary uh, film of the event. So. Although Thomas Hardy was buried in uh, 1928, there is news footage of this event. And if you're interested, you can view this on YouTube. Um, I don't have the URL for it, but it, it won't be difficult to find. You just do a Google search, Thomas Hardy funeral, and you can now see a YouTube film of his, of his funeral in 1928. So I'm just going to say a few words about this. One of the uh, more unexpected items now to be found on YouTube is the Pathé News film reel of the funeral of the British novelist Thomas Hardy in 1928. The event was an unusual one, even at the time, inasmuch as Thomas Hardy had requested that his body and his heart be buried in two separate locations. So body in one place, heart in the other and he wanted his heart to be buried in Stinsford Churchyard um, in Dorsetshire, uh, sorry, near Dorchester, where, where he lived. And uh, the film, the film from 1928, captures the intense public interest in this somewhat macabre last rite. While the funeral procession with the priest carrying the heart in a square box Exits the, exits the church in an orderly fashion. The vast crowds which filled the churchyard jostle for position and those lining the church path to the right are clearly distracted by a disturbance off camera. We then glimpse a policeman vainly attempting to restore order before the crowd surges forward like a tidal wave once the cortege has passed. In contrast to the slow, dignified movement we typically associate with funerals, that's something else to think about when we, we think about funerals, that, that uh, not only movement, but often the slowness of movement at funerals. Here, in this film, speed is of the essence. 
Look again, and you'll notice one of the elderly men in the cortege swiftly overtakes his fellows in order to get to the head of the procession, while on the outskirts of the cemetery, figures may be seen running around the back of the crowd in order to gain a better view. The burial of the heart takes place under a large tree, but for the camera doing the filming, the ceremony itself is obscured by the huge crowd that closes in around the scene. Deeply fascinating for any number of reasons, what makes this one minute film so compelling for me is the glimpse it provides of the mobilities associated with funerals in Britain in the early years of the 20th century. And for the purposes of this talk, the commentary it offers on Hardy's fiction, which is strewn with tragic characters whose hearts likewise become separated from their bodies during their life journeys. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so next slide, please. There we are. Thank you. Thank you. That's great. Um, in his book, Lines, uh, the anthropologist Tim Ingold draws a particular distinction between the additive and reductive ways in which lines are formed in the landscape, the second of which is of particular significance in the mobilities reading of Hardy's novel. So I'm, I'm just going to read to you what, what Ingold says about lines. He says, lines that are scratched, scored or etched into a surface are reductive, since in this case they are formed by the removal of material from the surface itself. Like threads, traces abound in the non-human world. They mostly result from the movement of animals appearing as paths or tracks. Human beings also leave reductive traces in the landscape through frequent movement along the same route, on foot or on horseback, and more recently by wheeled vehicles. So he's re reflecting on, uh, j just very simply but quite profoundly, on the way in which all of us leave marks on the landscape. As well as reminding us that the laying down of tracks in a landscape is something that both human and non-human animals share, Ingold's observation alerts us to the way in which um, tracks are one of the most material and lasting expressions of repetitive movement. <clears throat> Excuse me. When a track forms between one place and another, it exposes what is undeniably a significant connection be between two between the two and is thus a powerful tool through which to gauge the seriousness of our intimate relationships. Although in the contemporary world our feet may leave no trace as they glide invisibly over concrete, tarmac, carpet and other post-industrial surfaces, were we to mark them with indelible ink they would in an instant reveal which people and which places matter to us most. And that's worth all of us having a think about if you think which are the routes we make most every day. Um, our tracks tell us something very profound about uh, who are the most important people in our lives, which are the most important places. In The Woodlanders, we witness characters making tracks, following tracks, reading tracks and memorialising tracks, and all in the pursuit or defence of love. The human subject at the centre of all this track making and route finding is Grace Melbury, a young woman of marriageable age, educated by her yeoman father for better things, who is re relentlessly tracked down in the course of the novel, not only by her two suitors, Giles and Edred, but also by her father. Um, and next slide, please. <clears throat> So the, the, the next slide is, is a quote from, from Hardy's novel. Thank you. Oh, lovely, thank you. So quote from the novel. Some flecks of Grace's white drapery had enabled Giles to keep Grace and her father in view all the time. But now he, <coughs> excuse me, he lost sight of them and was obliged to follow by ear. Was it worth to go further? He examined the doughty soil at the foot of the stile and saw amongst the large sole and heel tracks an impression of a slighter kind from a boot that was obviously not local. 
and the mud picture was enough to make him swing himself over the stile and proceed. So an example of a character literally reading the tracks, the marks in the landscape. Elsewhere, however, um, the long established woodland tracks that the protagonists follow and renew are palpable expressions of ancient connections between families and individuals who have lived and worked together for generations. Indeed, what distinguishes the native woodlanders from outsiders in the environs of Little Hintock is their ability to find their way about the maze of paths, lanes and shortcuts without getting lost. This sort of knowledge and the patterns of movement it gives rise to also characterises the relationship between Giles Winterbourne and an, another woman, Marty South, a fellow woodlander whom he has worked alongside since childhood. Because Winterbourne's desire is focused on grace, he never realises that Marty has always been in love with him and fails to recognise their special intimacy. The philosopher Henri Bergson would explain such haptic knowledge, that is, knowledge of the body, in terms of the habit memory of the body in contrast to the deliberations of the conscious mind. So memory of the body versus memory of the mind. Uh, which brings me to a consideration of how Maurice Merleau-Ponty's concept of the body subject can help us better understand the mobilities that sustain long-term relationships and inform the rituals associated with mourning. So ne next slide, please. <clears throat> <coughs> Excuse me. That's it. Lovely. Thank you. Um, were an anthropologist such as Tim Ingold able to visit the fictional microcosm of Little Hintock and undertake a scientific investigation of the footprints and tracks that crisscross its environs? One well trodden path that would surely come to his attention is the one that connects Marty South and Giles. Winterbourne's residences. Long regarded by hardy critics as one another's double, these two native woodlanders are custodians of Hintock's forestry practices and their associated mobilities. The century-long knowledge involved in planting, coppicing, harvesting, felling and wood turning. The way in which the two work so effortless, effortlessly and instinctively at their tasks and with one another is also exemplary of Damon's, David Seaman's account of how body subjects come to perform their body ballets. So two concepts here, the body subject and the body ballet. And for my purposes is illustrative of a particular order of intimacy that is profoundly at odds with the conscious premeditated actions of courtship and which is arguably an essential ingredient for the success of long term relationships. Merleau-Ponty's concept of the body subject, which arose from his work on perception as part of a radical challenge to uh, Cartesian mind-body dualism, is based on the notion that there is no finite distinction between the subject and the world. Rather, the world is known through the body via its habitual everyday motor skills, most of which are expressed as mobilities of some kind. So we know the world through the body. Um, as David Seaman observes, quote, the body holds within itself an active intentional capacity, which ultimately knows in its own special fashion, the everyday spaces in which the person lives his typical day. In Hardy's novel, the character of Marty South is defined by her fluent, elegant performance of this haptic knowledge as illustrated in the following portrait of her in the opening pages. So next slide, please. Right, thank you. So description of Marty. With a bill hook in one hand and a leather glove much too large for her on the other, she was making spars such as are used by thatchers with great rapidity. To produce them, she took up each gad looked critically at it from end to end, cut it to length, split it into four and sharpened each of the quarters with dexterous blows, which brought it to a triangular point precisely resembling that of a bayonet. Hard and arduous as this work is, Marty can accomplish it with a speed and grace that astonishes observers, 
thus demonstrating that skill rather than strength is the crucial factor. Although habitual and mundane, Marty's work also depends upon timing and rhythm, two of the characteristics which feature in Siemens' account of body ballet. And I'm just now going to share with you um, David Siemens' description, his account of body, body ballet. So next slide, please. Lovely, thank you. So body ballet. Body ballet is a, a set of integrated gestures and movements which sustain a particular task or aim. Body ballets are frequently an integral part of manual skill or artistic talent. For example, washing dishes, ploughing, house building, uh, hunting or potting. Uh, also, operating an ice cream truck can involve body ballet. And he, he describes the movements involved in uh, selling ice cream. Taking orders, scooping ice cream, making change, all involve a pattern and flow that quickly becomes routine. Words like flow and rhythm indicate the body ballet is organic and integrated rather than stepwise and fragmentary. So for my work on the mobilities that inform our interpersonal relationships, um, the concept of body ballet becomes especially interesting when used to explain the special, often unseen bond between two people when they go about their everyday tasks. While the bodily synergies are not um, necessarily a mark of love or erotic intimacy, it could be said that they are its prerequisite. In the fictional world of the Woodlanders, Marty and Giles are seen moving about one another with a fluidity and ease that is presented by Hardy as unconscious, but which is, I would argue, rather more than the functional expression of uh, Merleau-Ponty's motor skills or what Hardy himself refers to in the novel as secondary intelligence. The connotation of dance is perhaps the crucial supplement here. The body subjects of Marty and Giles anticipate and mirror one another's actions in ways that are as ascetic as they are instrumental as illustrated in the following tree planting episode. So next slide, please. Thank you. So this is describing Giles and Marty at work in the forest. He had a marvelous power of making trees grow. Marty who turned a hand to anything was usually the one who performed the task of keeping the trees in a perpendicular position whilst he threw in the mould. Her only reply was turning to take up the next tree and they planted on through a great part of the day almost without another word. So a lovely image of them there, the two of them there in the woodland all day long um, in this rhythm um, uh, voice. They don't need to talk to each other to communicate. They, they just have this um, uh, unique understanding of each other and each other's bodies in doing this task. Elsewhere in the novel, the embodied and kinesthetic empathy that exists between Giles and Marty's body subjects is seen not in their work, but simply in the way they move about one another. Um, so next slide, please. Thank you. They went out and walked together. They had no remarks to make to each other and they uttered none. Hardly anything could be more isolated or more self-contained than the lives of these two here in the lonely hour before day, when grey shades, material and mental, are so very grey. Although not advertised as such, these wordless walks may be seen as a courtship ritual of sorts, especially given that Marty, for all her silence, is deeply in love with Giles. It is also a mode and manner of mobility that is singularly lacking in both Giles and Edred Fitzpiers courtship of Grace. The significance of this contrast, moreover, relates not only to the success of a courtship, but also our capacity to remember and mourn our loved ones when they are lost to us. And I now turn to the third and final section of my paper in which I reflect upon the manner in which Marty grieves for Giles after his untimely death while he is trying to protect Grace. So now a few words explicitly on the mobilities of mourning. So um, 
As I've discussed elsewhere, the ending of Hardy's novel centres on Giles' sacrifice. He offers Grace Fitzpiers the shelter of his hut when she is cast out of her father's home on account of her husband's infidelity and her own subsequent association with Giles. In order to avoid compromising her reputation still further, Giles refuses to share the hut with her and during a cold spell catches pneumonia and dies. In the weeks and months immediately following this tragedy, Grace and Marty come together in their mourning of Giles. So um, they've, uh, they've, they've both loved Giles at different times in their lives and, and now come together in their, their mourning of him. So, so next slide, please. Thank you. The church stood somewhat outside the village and could be reached without passing through the street. In the dusk of the late September day, they went thither by secret ways, walking mostly in silence side by side, each busied with her own thoughts. They stood at the grave together, and though the sun had gone down, they could get glimpses of the woodland for miles. So in terms of the mobility practices I discuss in my article, Trackless Morning, this scenario is both familiar and unique. Familiar in as much as the deep mourning for lost loved ones is in part a private and invisible act, uh, iterated here in the, in the phrase, they went by secret ways, but also unique in as much as two women are sharing and grieving the memorialization together. Geography is important here too, since the distance of the churchyard from the village facilitates the ceremony and, of course, replicates the route taken by the funeral procession itself. Following Grace's reconciliation with her erring husband, however, Marty is left to continue the, to continue the weekly ritual on her own. The novel marks the occasion when Grace first forgets to turn up by referring to Grace as Marty's uh, fellow pilgrim, and in so doing, foregrounds the crucial role that walking has played in the expressing in the expression of this morning ritual. Our final image of Marty, however, connects her with Giles through the everyday mobility practices they shared as skilled woodlanders, and demonstrates most evocative, evocatively uh, Omri Bergson's theory of how embodied memory is activated by pra practical necessity. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So th this is Marty speaking, her, her final words as she, uh, she mourns at Giles's uh, grave. She says, now my own love, she whispered, you are mine and only mine, for she has forgot, for forgot at last. And whenever I lie down, I'll think of thee again. Whenever I plant the young larches, I'll think that none can plant as you planted. And whenever I split a gad, and whenever I turn the cider ring, I'll say none could do it like you. If ever I forget your name, let me forget home and heaven. But know my love, I can never forget ye, for you was a good man and did good things. So, uh, we can see from this that Marty will remember Giles every time she reenacts a skill uh, that he was expert in and in the process finds solace in fusing with or becoming the person that she's loved and lost. Um, a perfect example, I think, of how mobility is integral to both memory and mourning in its non-representality uh, and uh, often invisible to others. Um, and then if, we, if we've got time, some just very final final thoughts. Are we okay for time? Yeah? Yes, ma'am, please go ahead. Yes. Okay, just, fine. Just two, two minutes. Thank you. So in my uh, trackless morning article, I contrast this mode of mourning involving the smallest bodily movements and gestures invisible to anyone else with the spectacular public mourning that has been a feature of Christian funeral practices for centuries. Uh, next slide, please. With reference to William Faulkner's novel from the 1930s, As I Lay Dying, I demonstrate the way in which the mobilities involved in Christian burial appear to make the process as visible and protracted 
as possible. J j tr deliberately trying to make it a really long, slow, lengthy process. And I know that from the little I do know that that is so different, for example, from a, a, a Hindu funeral, which has to happen very quickly, I think within 24 hours. In the Christian tradition, the emphasis seems to have been on making it as long as possible. For those of you not familiar with Faulkner's novel, the story revolves around a quest to bury Ad Addie's husband is determined to have her buried in her hometown of Jefferson, but the journey to transport the body there on a cart drawn by a pair of mules encounters one obstacle after another, and long-standing feuds within the family lead to fights and further delays. This means that by the time the family finally arrives in Jefferson, Addie's corpse has been on the road for several days and in the hot weather is beginning to decompose. The description of the cortege arriving at the outskirts of the city captures something of the horror and ridiculousness of this. The journey should never, never have taken this long had the family members thought of Addie, the deceased person, rather than themselves. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll just, just read the, the last part of this quote. Um, this is what, one of the characters speaking, uh, or two of, the character, two of the characters in conversation. So Farjaman says, is that it, Dahl? Is that Jefferson? He too has lost flesh. Like ours, his face and expression strained, dreamy and gaunt. Yes, I say. He lifts his head and looks at, at the sky. High above it, uh, the vultures hang in narrowing circles like the smoke with outward resemblance of form and purpose, but with no inference of motion, progress or retrograde. So a really evocative image there of immobility. Um, and this this image captures how um, how protracted, how frustrating this journey has been to get Addy buried. Uh, quote goes on, we mount the wagon where Cash lies on the box, that, in, that is, on his mother's coffin, the jagged shards of cement cracked about his leg. The shabby mules droop, rattling and clanking down the hill. So a grim and grotesque image of this funeral procession finally arriving in Jefferson several days late. Um, Faulkner's novel must, of course, be seen as a, a deliberately grotesque parody of the mobilities which see the deceased moved quite unnecessarily from one place to another until they are finally laid to rest. However, this highly staged ceremony dating back to ambrosial Catholic rituals from the 8th and 9th century AD persist largely unnoticed in Christian funerals in the West in the 21st century. Well, very occasionally, the deceased person might be delivered straight from the family home or hospital to the church or crematorium. It's still much more usual for the, for the body to be sent on a journey from the place of death to a chapel of rest and then onto the church, sometimes with an overnight stay at the, at the family home on the way. As I discuss in my article, the reason why this long journey continues to be such a feature of funerals in the West is probably best explained uh, through the opportunity it affords the bereaved to perform, uh, to perform their grief through a pilgrimage of sorts. Indeed, in some parts of the UK, families still choose to walk behind the coffin on the way to church. Um, interestingly, a practice that became popular again, that has become popular again during the pandemic, when the numbers attending church services um, has been limited. So we've been seeing more of people um, actually following the coffin on its journey. However, there can be no question that um, such protracted, uh, delayed uh, um, uh, journeys also perform the role of making mourning more visible and spectacular and is therefore in stark contrast to the invisible mourning practiced by Marty South in Hardy's novel. Um, in all types of mourning, movement and mobility nevertheless plays a crucial role and a close attention to this sort of distinction can be immensely helpful, I think, in bringing cultural and historical differences to light 
and also documenting how the practices associated with death and mourning are changing today. So, um, uh, final slide, please. Uh, I'll end there. Um, I've come to the end of my talk. Um, I hope this talk uh, will have sparked some interesting discussion points for your webinar. Um, although I've limited knowledge of funeral and mourning practices in other cultures, I'm confident that mobilities of some kind will play a role in all of them. Um, be these the small and silent gestures of the bereaved family members or the large public ceremonies to which mourners might have travelled many hundreds of miles. Uh, finally, um, yes, on this last slide, finally, if you're interested in this topic, I also recommend that you take a look at the work of the British geographer Avril Madrol, who's written extensively on grief and mourning within a mobility framework and whose work has inspired my own. So thank you very much indeed for inviting me to speak to you. And please do get in touch via email if you've got any further questions. And as I said before, we will be delighted for any of you to join our uh, mobilities uh, mailing list at the Centre for Mobilities Research in Lancaster. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Lynn, very much for your enlightening and uh, thought-provoking talk. Uh, your enlightening and thought-provoking talk. So you have uh, spoken of the whole thing in a very uh, broad perspective. Uh, we have the seminar theme, Aging, Disease and Death, and you have looked at the whole thing uh, from the lens, uh, from the angle of literature. Uh, that is through the lens of literature. You have, as you have said, three parts of speech, and thereby you have systematized the whole thing and put out the whole thing in a very nice way. Uh, you talked of British literature and uh, very widely, and you spoke of that in relation to not only to study of uh, the aging disease and death, but also in relation to the uh, prospective research that could be taken up. And yeah. what is even more interesting is uh, uh, you have linked the whole study very meticulously to humanities and literary studies, uh, broadly in the perspective of humanities and specifically to literary studies. Uh, that is the nicest part of your talk. Uh, then uh, a second part is very interesting because uh, you have explored the literary text, specific literary text, and uh, you have spoken of love and loss, and not only that, you have tracked of love and loss. Uh, you have talked about body subject, body valet, and gradually, in a very contextual way, you have moved over to memory and mourning, and its representation. Thank, thank you very, very much, much. Lynn. We are thankful and gratitude to you. I ex express my thanks and gratitude, not only on my behalf, uh, but also on behalf of the entire department. Uh, you have delivered a memorable uh, keynote speech today, and we have all our standing ovation for your speech. And we are really grateful to you. We'll always remember you. And thank you so much, Lynn. We'll be in touch with you. We'll be yes. in touch with you always, thank not just thank once. Thank and we'll you. seek uh, yeah. academic <laughs> collaboration from you. Thank you so much. Thank, thank, thank you so Oscar. much for inviting me. And it, it's been wonderful to make contact again after after 10 years. And we we, we yeah, will stay in yeah. touch. And, and come to come to Lancaster again in the future. Sure, 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 sure. <laughs> thank, thank you very thank much. You thank, so you. much. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Uh, so uh, thank you, uh, Professor Pierce, for giving us your valuable time and delivering this wonderful keynote address. And uh, thank you, Professor Patra, for chairing this session and also giving us 
you know uh, uh, some you know uh, some valuable remarks on on the lecture that professor pierce just delivered so thank okay. you for doing that yeah thank you so much thank both you both of you thank you very much thank you bye bye then thank you bye bye thank you so uh we uh so it's uh, so the keynote uh, address is over and now we will be uh, moving on to our first technical session so uh, the first technical session will be delivered uh, will be chaired by sorry will be chaired by dr khagendra sethi he is assistant professor uh, in the department of english